Well, good morning. good morning. I'm glad that you are here. I'm excited to open up the word with you this morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Nick. I'm one of our pastors here. Our head pastor, Dave, is on sabbatical. He's halfway through his sabbatical, and, uh, and I know that he's having a, a good time of rest and, and research as he's on that. And so, uh, so this morning, you're stuck with me. So praise the Lord for that. That's a good thing. Last week... Last week, uh, I wasn't here. Last week, I was on a mission trip with our high school students, uh, which if you've ever been on a mission trip, I know several of you have come before with us in the past, either volunteers or as a student, you know that not a lot of sleep happens during that week. And so I'm like on the very beginning stages of restoring my energy level. But, uh, but last week, we went to Marion, Ohio. Uh, and so at, in Marion, what, what kind of has happened is, is as the economy kind of kind of took a turn, a lot of industry moved out of Marion and, and left it and kind of fast-tracked an economic depression that sort of happened there. And, and, and a, lot of the, a lot of the people that were, were able-bodied workers left that area to go find work and it left behind people that weren't able to, to move to find work. And, and a lot of homes fell into disrepair and, and, and things just kind of started turning down. And so, and so what has happened is they've begun trying to restore the city of of Marion, and we were invited by Marion First Church of the Nazarene to come partner with them in that effort. And so we went over and we and we stayed in the church at Marion First Church, and then we we connected with a lot of different projects and things like that that the that our that our students were involved in. And and what we found out is uh, they called it Restoration Week. And what we found out about Restoration Week is that it's not just unique to that church, but it's actually a citywide initiative that takes place there. And so while we were there, we we brought you know, somewhere between 40 and 45 people with us while we were there, we were just a very small percentage of, of the number of people that were actually doing projects in the city that week. There were hundreds of people doing different projects that week. And so some of the things that we got to participate in was, you know, just, just some of our projects were just kind of cleaning up downtown, picking up trash and, and pulling weeds. And we did some landscaping for folks who were, who were unable to take care of their lawns and basic home repair. And there was a, there was a project that, that a crew did where they built a wheelchair ramp. And, and we actually, some of our students, we got to build a house. Like we, we were there and Habitat for Humanity was there. And so we got to partner with Habitat for Humanity and build a house from the foundation up, which was so cool because, because now I feel like I could build a house. But I keep telling my wife, like, why are we living here? I could just build a house. It's no problem. We did it in a week, right? We could do this. You know, but uh, but it was a really great time, and our and our students really represented the village very well in, in what they did, and so and so we, I can sit here and tell you about it, but we do have a video uh, that you can see. You can see our students at work and some of the projects we did. So let's watch this video.
Yeah, give it up for our students. So we got, uh, if, you were, if you were on the mission trip with us, raise your hand. I know there's several over here, okay, that you see hands over plates. I know a lot of them are volunteering in a lot of areas of the church, but, but they did a really great job. And here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to find a student this morning. They're all wearing these shirts. These are mission trip shirts. They're all wearing these. Find one of them and ask them about it. They'll tell you how the Holy Spirit showed up in huge ways. And, and a, lot of the, a lot of the things that we do in, in a mission trip while we're there to serve, one of the things that always happens is God always shows up for us. Like we go there to, to do for other people and then God shows up in big ways. And so we had a, a great time of, of worship this week and, and of serving. And one of, the, one of the interesting things that happened, and this happened almost every day, that, that we would be approached by somebody in the town who knew exactly who we were, they knew where we were from, and they knew what we were doing there. It was interesting to me. I, I, I wasn't, I, I, like, that's never happened on a mission trip for me before. But for, like, the first day, I'm standing there, and I'm watching some of our students work, and, and I see a cop approaching them, which usually is not a good it's not a good thing, right? And so I'm like, oh no, what's going on? And I walk up and, and, the, and the police officer is like, hey, are, are you guys, are, are you the, the, the church group that's from Philadelphia? And I'm like, yeah, is there, is there a problem? He goes, oh no, we have a thing on social media called God doing something good. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just posting something about your group on our, on our social media, you know? And he goes, thank you guys so much for what you're doing. And, and, and almost every day there was, there was people that would approach us and say, are you the group from Philadelphia? Oh man, thank you so much for, for coming and helping. And, and it was incredible to see how God was just, was just using our willingness to be there to touch people's lives relationally as we were doing work to help restore their, their town physically. Right, and and we even made the news. Like in their, they made in their newspaper. Like some of our some of our students got their picture taken. We're in the, the newspaper, so it was really kind of a, a cool thing. As God used our students, and as they represented our church and our kingdom and our God at a really high level. Ultimately, what they were doing was they were they were sharing truth and love in their actions. Like for, for our students, it wasn't just, hey, we're, we're, we're Christians, but they were putting their, their, the message to their actions. And they were out there and loving people and doing all kinds of jobs, no matter what it was, just to, just to show God's love to people. And it was incredible to, to get to be a part of that. And, and as I was thinking about today's, today's topic, I mean, that's kind, of, that's kind of what today's topic is all about, this idea of truth and love. When you think about those two words, truth and love, those are two words that go together, right? And we even have sayings like we speak truth in love. We, that's a saying that we say, and, and, and there's love and truth. Those are two words that are sort of symbiotically linked. They mean two different things, but they are symbiotically linked, and they, and they play off of each other. Truth grows in love, and love grows in truth. And so today, that's kind of our launch pad as we start a new series today called Truth in 12 Bars. And what we want to do over the next several weeks is look through the book of Psalms, which really is a, is a, is a compilation of songs. It's a compilation of worship songs that, that within it contain lots of truth. And so over the next several weeks, we're going we're gonna to kind of dive into Psalms and we're going to pull truths out from the different Psalms that, that, ha, that we can glean for our lives and, and how we live and how we worship our God. And so in truth, there is love and in love, there is truth. So the Psalm that we are going to, we're going to read this morning is Psalm chapter two. And Psalm chapter two is, is kind of unique when you really do research on what is happening in Psalm chapter two. It's really a unique Psalm that's happening. And, and kind of the background knowledge for you to have about Psalm two is that it's a poem and it's a poem written from the standpoint of the Messiah. So we're going to talk about that just in, in just a moment of what that means, but it's a Psalm written from the standpoint of the Messiah. Now this is, this is what it says. Psalm chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 7. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
Now, this, is, this psalm is really interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, the, the fact that it's written from the standpoint of the Messiah. Now, this is, a, this is a time in history where Israel had not yet seen its darkest days of history. And yet, even before they were in, in, in exile in Babylon, even before they were under Roman oppression, they understood the need for the Messiah. They understood that. They wrote about it in, in the Psalms. They wrote about their need for a Savior, their need for a Messiah who would restore them. Right? And so, and so, and so they understand that. They, 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 they began sort of characterizing it in, in common day understandings of who the Messiah would be. Now, in that day, when a, when a new king would rise up in a kingdom, it was not uncommon for all of the surrounding kingdoms to begin attacking that kingdom because it's a new king. They saw the new king as not as wise, as not as experienced, and maybe it was kind of a land grab. Maybe they, could, maybe they could absorb that kingdom into their own and increase their riches and their wealth. And so when a new king would rise up, all of these other nations would, would begin attacking it. And so from the standpoint of the Messiah in the psalm, that, that's what they're characterizing, that, that when the Messiah, the new king, rises up, that there will be those who come against him. However, he will laugh because they cannot prevail. They cannot prevail. And so they use some of these, some of these understandings of their Messiah, even though their understandings of Messiah was ancient. They're on that side of history. We're on this side of history. Right? We're on this side of history, and we can look and see the ways that they described who they understood the Messiah would be, and we can, we, can, we can ascribe those characteristics to who we know Jesus Christ is. Right? They understood Jesus Christ would be a king. They understood that the Messiah would be the king. We understand that Jesus Christ is the king. They understood that the Messiah would restore the nation of Israel and we understand that Jesus Christ restores all people unto him. They understood that the Messiah would face many who would try to take him down. And we understand that Christ prevailed against all. What really makes this psalm unique is it's the only, in my research, this is, this is what I, I kind of grabbed onto in my research of this, of this psalm. What, what really makes it unique is that it's the only place in the Old Testament that it connects the understanding of Messiah to the sonship of God, where he literally says, you are my son, whom I have begotten. We understand Christ to be God's one and only begotten son. And so it's easy for us on this side of history to say, okay, we know exactly who they're talking about in Psalm chapter two. They're talking about Jesus Christ. Because he lived into all, of these, into all of these characteristics. He lived into them. In fact, when, when Christ arose, you know, when he, when he arrives on the scene, it is not long before people rise up against him to try to take him down. I mean, it's in his infancy that Herod has all of the two-year-olds in the, in the land killed in his attempt to take down Jesus Christ. The Pharisees plot against Jesus to try to trick him to arrest him and and the Sadducees join that, the, the, the witch hunt against Jesus and, and they plot against him. And even Satan, I mean, even Satan, when Jesus was in the wilderness, Jesus is in the wilderness and he's fasting and he's praying and he's hungry. He's been, he's been fasting for 40 days and then Satan comes by to try to tempt Jesus. And this is how Satan tempts him. Satan says, Jesus, you must be hungry. Look, here's a stone. With the power that God has given you, you could turn this stone into bread and you could fill your stomach. Jesus withholds against the, the temptation. He says, Jesus, you could cast yourself off of this mountain and the angels at God's command would swoop and save you. you you're immortal. You could not die. Test and see. And Jesus withholds against that. And then, and then he takes him up on a mountain and he says, look, Jesus, everything you see could be yours. You know, it's interesting when you really think about, okay, what is Satan actually tempting Jesus with? You see, Jesus came as the Messiah, and as the Messiah, his role is to pour love and the truth and restoration into you. Right through his power, through his, through his, through his lordship, through his kingship, that is his, that is his function. And what Satan, out of his hate for humanity, wants to do is he wants to trick Jesus into relinquishing his messiahship. That once Jesus gives him the temptation to serve himself, he is no longer the messiah. 
If he turns in and withholds himself for his own sake, that's ultimately what, what Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to do because, because Satan wanted to remove Jesus from Messiahship and yet Jesus prevailed against him. You know, when you think about it, this is the way it is for us. And when you think about what is it that the enemy really tempts us with, right? What is it that he really puts out there for us to, for us to be tempted by and for us to give in to? And he uses a lot, of, a lot of deceit. He uses a lot of lies. And he uses the world and the messages of the world to sway us. He uses the messages of the world to sway our allegiance from God and from Jesus to ourselves, Right, we hear messages from the world that it's offensive. If you believe in this, it's offensive to me, so you shouldn't believe in it. We don't want to be offensive. Or it's offensive if you vote a certain way or, or try this and your life will be better or spend your money on that and all your dreams will come true. These are the messages of the world and the messages of the world is saying, you have the power, you are king. You can be God of yourself. You can overcome everything on your own. See, the message of the world tries to turn us away from our need of Jesus, from our need of a Messiah, where even long before the Messiah ever was there, even long before Jesus came, Israel knew their need for Messiah. But that's what Satan tries to trick us into believing. He tempts us, really, he tempts us the same way he tempts Christ. He tempts us to be focused in on ourselves. He tempts us to be king of ourselves. He tempts us to replace God with ourselves. He tempts us to become God of ourselves. I mean, think about this. Think about the first deceit. Way back in the Garden of Eden. Genesis. The book of Genesis tells a story of the first temptation, the first sin. Right? And what is it that Satan really gets them on? He says, listen. Guys, Adam, Eve, I don't think God's telling you everything. He starts dropping little lies on them. I don't think God's telling you everything, right? Surely this fruit is good. Surely it tastes great. He just doesn't want you to have it. He just doesn't want you to have good things, right? Then he says, didn't he tell you that if you eat this fruit, you will become like God? That's a complete lie because we know they ate the fruit. They didn't become like God. But that's how he did it. He says, you will become like God. And that temptation was so powerful for them that they gave in. It's the same thing he tempts us with. To the core of, of Satan's temptation is deceit. And, and, and it starts out really small, right? It starts out really small, like, like try this or do that. And then, and then little compromise after little compromise after little compromise leads you into a life of full-blown sin. And the ultimate purpose that he wants for you is to disconnect you from truth and from love because of the deceit that's born out of his hate for us. He wants to connect us to deceit and disconnect us from love. So the core of his temptation at the core of his temptation is deceit that's born out of hate, which also means that at the core of our rebellion, like when we rebel against God, the core of that rebellion starts when we buy into Satan's lies. When we buy into the lies that our enemy has for us, we begin to reject the love and the truth that God has for us. Right? And there's two really big lies that we buy into. The first we just talked about, that, that you are God of your own self. Right? That's the first lie that, that we buy into. The second one, the second one, and, and, he, and he does this in the garden, right? And he tells them God's trying to withhold goodness from you. The second lie he tries to get us to buy into, that, that, that the bad things in our lives are caused by God. He tries to convince us that, that God causes all good things, but he also causes all bad things so that when tragedy strikes in my life, it's easy for me to blame God, right? And if I start blaming God and I start putting some doubt in, in, in God because I'm experiencing this bad stuff in my life and I think it's, it's because God allowed it or God made it or God caused it, then it's easy for me to become separated and, and, and disillusioned with who God is. But here is the truth. The truth is, and this is what scripture says, that God gives us all good things. 
But we also know that the author of evil is Satan. He's the one that tries to trick us that, that it comes from God, but he's the one that caused all suffering and all harm and brokenness in the world. He's the one that tempted Adam and Eve at the begin, to begin with through all that death poured into us. So we experience hardship and suffering and grief and, and struggle because of who Satan is and what he's done, and yet he tricks us oftentimes to believe that it's because of God, and we blame God. And you know what his ultimate goal is? His ultimate goal is that we would reject Christ. His ultimate goal is that we would cast Jesus out of our life. His ultimate goal is that we would become so confused about truth and about love that we buy into these lies and we push Jesus out of our life, that we push the Messiah away. That we decide we don't need a savior. That's his goal. Out of his hate for humanity, out of his hate for God, he tries to disconnect God's creation from him. However, here is the truth, and I think we read this in, this, in Psalm chapter 2. Here is the truth this morning. That you cannot cast Christ out of your life. You are unable to. Scripture says this, that neither, that neither heaven or hell or anything in it, including you, cannot separate you from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. You can't separate yourself from it. You can reject it, you can denounce it, you can walk away from it, but it will not go away. He loves you way too much for that. You can't be separated from Christ. You can reject the benefits of his kingship. You can walk away from his grace. You can make decisions on your own, but that does not cause him to cease being Jesus. And it does not remove him as king from your life. I, I was thinking about it like this. When I was a, when I was a kid, that's when my, my parents got divorced when I was a kid, and, and, and then they remarried, right? And so now I had these step parents, and and as I was growing up, you know, um, those of you that have had step parents, you, you know, or, or, or if you're a, a, a or, if, or if you are a step parent, you know that there is like a time of tension there. You know what I mean? When when I got a new parent that was telling me what to do, like I had a problem with that. You know what I mean? And so and so there was this tension there. And I remember more than once telling my stepdad and my stepmom both at different times, you're not my dad. You're not my mom. But you know what I learned as I, as I grew up and as I matured and as I reflect back on my relationship with my, with my step-parents? I learned something really, really important. That, that those words, father, mother, parent, they're not nouns. They're verbs. And no matter how much I said, you're not my father, it did not cause my stepdad to not love me. And in fact, I'm lucky because my stepdad and my stepmom, they adopted me relationally as their own child. And they loved me that way and they raised me that way and they cared for me that way and they provided for me that, for that way. So, no, so matter, no matter how many times I said, you're not my mom, you're not my dad, it did not stop them from being my parents. And the truth is I could get up, I could run away, I could set up a life somewhere else and never, ever, ever talk to him again, but it does not take away from how much they love me, and that's exactly how it works with Jesus Christ. That you can reject him, you can say, I don't want heaven, I don't want your grace, I don't want your forgiveness, I don't want your love, but it does not stop him from loving you. Because he's Jesus. Because he's your king. Because he cares about you too much for that. In fact, Paul says this, and this is, this is incredible. Paul says this, he says, we are adopted as sons and daughters into the kingdom of God through the love of Jesus Christ. That's what the apostle Paul says. Like right there, he, he, he clears it all up for us that that is how we are loved by our creator. And that is, is what our enemy wants to separate you from. He wants to confuse you on that. He wants, to, he wants to mix you up. He wants to trick you that that doesn't exist and that that's not real. It's that fact right there that he tries to, to create a cloud. 
And so in the same way that, that truth and love are linked and they lead you to life and life in abundance, deceit and hate are linked and lead you towards death. And when you buy into the lie that our enemy drops on you, those little whispers, those little temptations, those little lies that he puts out there, when you buy into those, you put yourself on that path towards death. And you know what? This is something we can't escape. Death is chasing after all of us. It's part of being a human. Death is chasing after all of us because of our enemy, because of Satan. Death is chasing after all of us. And even after Jesus overcame the temptation in the wilderness, even after he overcame the Pharisees and overcame the Sadducees, death came after him. And in fact, it was death because of the confusion that, 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 that was happening with, 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 the, with them, the, they, the death kind of got in there and there was some confusion and they were rejecting Jesus and then all of a sudden he's on a cross and they're nailing him to a cross and death is knocking on his door. And yet even when death nailed Jesus to a cross, he overcame. Even in the face of death, Christ prevailed. Christ prevailed. And this is, what, this is what else Paul says. Paul says this. He says it works like this. That when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, when you come into relationship with the King of Kings, when you come into relationship with the Lord of Lords who loves you specifically, that this, this spiritual thing happens where, where, where your old self, your old way of life, your, the way you lived in, in, in deceit, that gets nailed to the cross and gets buried but in the same way Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave, you are resurrected in a new life, a life that goes after him, a life that's full of love, a life that's full of truth, a life that's full of life itself. That you don't have to worry about death at all because Jesus overcame, he prevailed against death, so do you. You prevail and cannot be held down even to death itself. Amen. And that's the great truth we get about who the Messiah is. So when you reject that lie and you put, on, put Christ as king of your life, death cannot take you down. And all of the struggle, all of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the hardship, all of the life that is a result of death can be overcome through Jesus Christ forever. I really think that it was with this stuff in mind, it was with this truth in mind, it was with this love in mind that Jesus gathered his disciples at that Last Supper and began to teach them because sitting around Jesus, you have sitting around Jesus, his disciples, and they're about to celebrate this meal and the bread's there and the, and, and the cup's there. And, and if you just take a look around the table, you got Thomas, who doubted Jesus. You've got Peter, who was about to deny him. You got Judas, who just betrayed him. And Jesus is looking at these guys and honestly, these guys aren't dissimilar to us in many ways. They bought into lies of the enemy. And then Jesus teaches them, guys, look at these symbols. Look at what I'm about to do. My body is about to be broken. My blood, it's about to be spilled. And you know why? Because I love you. I love you. It's through what I'm about to do. It's through what I'm about to do that you will find wholeness in your life. This is what the Messiah came for. And so when you move from this point, when you move from this point, and you come across hardship and struggle and pain and suffering, this is what Jesus says. He says, do this to remember me. That's why communion is so important. It's why we, it's why we celebrate with communion every month together 
is so that in the midst of life, we take a moment and we remember not just who Jesus is, not just who Jesus was, not just what he did, but that we remember the grace and love and truth that he pours freely into you because he loves you and wants you to have life. So this morning, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a, a, a prayer. We'll bless the elements and our, our ushers will deliver the elements to you. But as you hold those elements, this is what I would encourage you to meditate on. This is what I would re- encourage you to reflect on. Because I think that there are, there are some that are gathered here this morning who would evaluate their lives and say, you know what, there are parts of my life that I'm withholding from the king. That there's a temptation or there's an addiction or there's an anger or there's an illness that I haven't given and relinquished to the king. And so this morning, what Christ wants of you is he wants to be Lord. He wants to be king of your entirety. He wants to be king of your life. And so if that's you this morning, and if that's you, would you sit there and you reflect and you identify, here's an area that I have held on for myself. It's time to let that go and allow him to be king of your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. For the broken body and the spilled blood. Lord, we thank you that you're not this far off God, but rather you are interactive with us on an individual level. Father, that you love us specifically. Father, that you love us on purpose and for purpose. And Father, even though we may not even be able to fully understand what that means or how much that love is or how great, just the fact that you love us at all is incredible. And so this morning as we're gathered here, Lord, I know that there are some who are in the midst of hardship and struggle. And they're working their way through it and it's, and, it's, and it's tough and it's trying and it's exhausting. Lord, I pray this morning right now that they would connect themselves to truth and to love and to grace and to strength and to guidance that you have for them as they pronounce you as king over their whole lives and their whole self. Lord, we pray that you bless these elements as we receive them. The bread and the cup. As we examine our hearts, we offer ourselves to you.